Well, it's great to be back. Good to see you. Glad that you're here. Uh, had, a, I think, a very encouraging week uh, out at Fort Worth, a productive week. I uh, was really uh, thankful to have a chance to have fellowship with those folks. and met some very good people, and um, they made me feel useful, and I appreciated the time there. But i uh, very happy to be home and looking forward to continuing our opportunities here to study the Bible together and to learn more about His will. And uh, we've already had some opportunities along that line. I hope you were able to take advantage of the classes this morning. And um, later today, if the Lord wills, we do have uh, uh, the opportunity to meet at 345. We'll have, the ladies will have their class, and then we'll have the class back there for the men, at which we're studying the subject of leadership. Um, you know, uh, got a chance to visit with the elders out there in Texas, and um, sharp guys, and uh, talking to one of them about this very issue that, in his view, he feels like that, you know, the church certainly calls to people to come and obey the gospel, and that's right. Um, and we certainly teach aspects of worship and daily living and all that's true, but he said he wasn't sure that we did a great job of teaching our people uh, to take the next step and to become leaders. And I said, well, that's what we're trying to do in this class is to uh, encourage each other, uh, those who are younger and those not so young, learning more about how to lead. Some of that involves becoming a deacon and becoming an elder. And some of it is, is people who never will be that. But they're still leaders. Uh, and as we say, they're certainly leaders among the women in their own way. And they're within those limits there. They do a lot of good in that regard. But we're primarily thinking about male leadership and looking to grow men to be better leaders. Uh, this is an important effort, I believe. And I think we can help each other. I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm, I'm growing in myself, I hope, in this regard. But I really want to encourage you to pray for that class, to, to think about and prepare for that class. We plan today, and I do apologize, you know, we started that class off with high hopes and we have had more misses than we've had opportunities to have it. But uh, we do hope maybe to have a more regular opportunity to meet together. And uh, we're going to be looking at lesson three and maybe lesson four today. But lesson three revolves around the leadership of Joshua and his example. And lesson four is King Saul, two very different kind of leaders, two very different individuals. But I think there are great lessons to be learned there. And I say again, you know, this is a class that's not intended just to be lecture. I think it's an opportunity for all of us to come together, bring our experiences, look at the Word of God, and see if we can help each other learn how to lead better. It's an important effort, and I encourage you to be a part of that, uh, and, uh, and it'll be a help to me uh, as well as to others, and I hope to yourself as you do that. But we do have that this afternoon. Then uh, tonight we have the singing, and uh, that's our monthly singing. We're looking forward to that. And, um, and so we encourage you, all the men here, uh, to, uh, uh, to put some thought into a song that you would like to sing, and let's all sing those lessons and be edified by that time together. Um, and then we have a meeting coming up quickly. Really good looking flyer that Jeff put together there. And uh, encourage you to continue to pray for the meeting. I think we have uh, some uh, on the backboard there. At least earlier there were some slots for those who might lead, lead, like to lead the singing during that effort for Friday and Saturday, as well as meal opportunities. Do hope to spend some time with Brother, uh, Brother Sam uh, Sunday. Uh, so we, uh, we have our monthly young people's class. And this also has had some, some uh, postponements. But uh, I'd like the help of the fellows here, the, the families and the, and the younger folks who are part of that class. Uh, because of the meeting, it looks to me like we have a choice. Then the next week we have our uh, after, after service, we have our, our prayer meeting. So we can either meet with a young people's class on the fourth Sunday of this month, or we'll wait till the second Sunday of next month. You can let me know what you think will work best in that regard. And, uh, and I'd be glad to hear, have your input on that. We, we look forward to getting that class restarted as well. 
Anyway, uh, we do have a lot of opportunities here to try to, to approach God and to be made stronger. And that in part is what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I want you to read with me, if you would, over in uh, the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 is where we'll begin the lesson. Verse 1 reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one of the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his own burdens. We're familiar with this passage, and he talks here about a man being overtaken in a fault. You know, I'm not saying that uh, there's not some application to this in different cases, but there are different ways people get into sin. And here he pictures specifically somebody who seems to slip and fall, somebody who's caught up in something before they're even aware of it. There are other people who seem to be much more hardened. And sometimes the approach is more bold. Uh, you just turn back a few pages, and uh, here we have uh, the uh, Apostle Peter, who uh, up in Antioch played the hypocrite, and Paul said he was to be blamed, and I withstood him to the face, and I said before them all, that's a very bold approach to a matter, but it's a different kind of case. Um, I guess maybe one of the more extreme examples is uh, Matthew chapter 23, where the Lord just uh, tore apart some of his uh, uh, more hardened religious opponents, and he talks about them being uh, children of hell, and uh, he said they're blind guides and, and uh, serpents and a generation of vipers. Very bold words in that case. I don't think any of it was inaccurate or unloving. But different cases might require a different response. But in this passage, what he seems to be suggesting is gentleness. If a man is overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Wouldn't do any good for a fellow who was not spiritual to try to, to straighten other folks out. He wouldn't have much of an effect. And it's not an accident, is it, that he connects here spirituality with meekness because, well, again, in the same uh, letter, in the fifth chapter, Paul reminds us that uh, it's a fruit of the Spirit, meekness, gentleness, a kindness. He says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You're looking at yourself and your own limitations, and, and, and you're conscious of that as you approach uh, your neighbor. Uh, it reminds us so much of, of Luke 18 uh, in which the Lord draws the picture of the two men praying at the temple and the Pharisee prays standing with himself and saying, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Extortion is unjust, even this publican. <laughs> you know, he didn't have much gentleness about him and he wasn't considering himself. The truth is that that publican was closer to God than he was. There was a lack of self-awareness that would cause him to be anything but meek. Consider yourself. It'll help you to be meek. And he said, when you, when you have the right mindset, you can restore such a one. We can have that effect. We can be the bridge that helps people get back on track. It reminds us of the ending of the book of James, doesn't it? Where James said in verse 19 of chapter 5, James 5, 19. Uh, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. What a difference it can make that we can make for each other. If we're off track that somebody who loves us might come to us in the spirit of meekness and help us to see our error. What a blessing that is. And so bear one another's burdens. That I think is what he's talking about there, isn't it? But then he says, and, and by the way, fulfill the law of Christ when you do that. 
But then he talks about another kind of fellow, a man who thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And we ask, where in the world does this guy come from? Well, he's not from just out of the blue somewhere. This guy is uh, the fellow who lacks this, I think. It's the same case, but instead of being spiritual and being sp filled with the spirit of meekness, here's a man who really thinks too much of himself. He thinks himself to be something when he's nothing. He has no self-awareness. He has no spirit of meekness. He's proud. He looks at this fellow and says, I don't have that problem. And because he doesn't have that problem, he thinks himself elevated and he looks down on somebody else and it's just a, a, just a, a ball rolling downhill of just one bad thing after another falling further and further away from God in our attitude. And what he says here is, if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Let every man prove his own work. Start by testing yourself. Start by applying your high principles to yourself. Isn't that the old lesson the Lord taught in uh, Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount? And those unforgettable words, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why do you behold the moat, the speck in your brother's eye? And consider not the beam that is in your own eye. It's really, it's, it's serious, but it's funny. Here's a fellow who's got a board sticking out of his head. He's trying to pick a speck out of somebody's eye. What's wrong with you, he said. Why don't you work on that, that board, that piece of lumber sticking out of your skull, and then you might be able to help somebody else. Start with yourself. But the man that doesn't do that, and he thinks that somehow because on this point or that point that I know more than this guy knows, I'm further down the road than this guy is, that somehow I'm lifted up in my own mind. How self-deceived we are. Let every man prove his own work, verse 4. Then shall you have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. What does he mean by that? I think one of the modern speech translations captured it when it said, when he talks about rejoicing not in another, not in comparison to anyone else. When a fellow's thinking right, he doesn't build his, his self-image on looking on other, finding somebody worse than he is, and then say, well, I'm better than him. That's not the way we think about things properly. That's not a spiritual way to think about it. And so he says, in the end, remember this, every man shall bear his own burden. And, and that's the, the puzzle of the passage. If we don't read it carefully, we might wonder, isn't there a contradiction here? He says, bear one another's burdens. He said, every man shall bear his own burden, which is true. Well, they're both true. That our whole life is dedicated to trying to help one another to make it, to, to, uh, to, to win, to succeed. When we see another stumbling, we help each other out, and we receive help in that same way. But I'll tell you, in the end, every one of us is going to have to answer for ourselves. Now, those are two really important principles, and I just want to emphasize that, those old lessons this morning for a few minutes. Let me start by making this point, that we are, we are given. It is fulfilling the law of Christ for us to be a, a spiritual blessing to other people. Uh, in every way, that's true. That's why God set up the family, wasn't it, don't you think? You ever wonder why that is? You know, you ever see the, the story about the sea turtles? You know, down on the Gulf in Alabama, they have, they have uh, a lot of laws and regulations. Don't bother the sea turtles. They come up there on the shore, lay the eggs, crawl back off into the sea, and that's it. The eggs hatch, make it or break it, uh, lots of luck. You know, the Lord didn't set up the family that way. He gave us the human family so that we might be able to, to help one another, to, to grow a generation before they're released into the world, as it were. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And those words for training and admonition are powerful. The word for nurture there, training, describes the whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs for this purpose now commandments and admonitions, now reproof and punishments, 
Whatever in adults also cultivates the soul, especially by correcting mistakes and curbing the passions. Boy, that's a big word. It just describes everything involved in rearing a child. And we, we know the sad story that so many kids today are, don't, are not reared by anybody. They just, they just grow up wild. Get whatever they get from the, from the, uh, the, the malls of the streets, as it were. But God did not intend for it to be that way. And we as parents bear the burdens of our children. We bring them along in the admonition, in the calling, in the warnings, in the rebukes, in the instruction of the Lord. I think about the story in Joshua. In Joshua chapter 4, uh, one of the things that uh, you all in the adult Bible class have been looking at recently is this story of Israel now as they enter into the promised land. These monuments that are set up. For example, the stones at Gilgal. And when your children, verse 21, shall ask you, and ask their fathers, I should say, in time to come, saying, What mean ye these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. The Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried up from before, uh, which he dried up from before us when you were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that it's mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. He said, this is a memorial so that your children might remember what the Lord has done. We're thinking about growing our children so that when we're gone, they still might know God. And he said, through them the world will know God. That's the idea. Bearing one another's burdens. Sharing the load. Helping people along spiritually. That's true in the family. And every parent in this room has it as their goal to do that. I'll tell you, I've met recently some uh, people, good people, dedicated people, whose children have turned out to be a heartbreak to them, an absolute heartbreak to them. Not everybody's story is, is the same. Some are different. Sometimes it involves, more than one time, it involves the idea of some young person who grew up in a house where they heard the gospel and they attended not only the services, they attended meetings and they were busy their parents are good people, but they come along and date someone and marry someone, and they go off in, in directions you can't believe. It, it is the job that all of us are trying to do to prevent the devil from ruining the lives of those we love so much. And all of us understand that. It could not be more serious. And boy, that time goes by quickly the time we have them under our control, as it were, uh, as young people, as little children, and as young adolescents. That's not only true in the family, that's true in the church. You know those fa familiar words in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. Shepherd the church Guide those sheep that God put in your care. Verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able, he says, to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. It's the job of the church to grow young people and to lead people uh, toward God. It's the job of the elders to shepherd the flock. In uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we find that uh, this uh, job, I think, expands beyond even the elders. Let me say this. For Donald and I, there is nothing more important than trying to make sure that this church provides opportunities for people to grow. We're looking to get the maximum out of our assemblies, for example, and out of other opportunities, the preaching, the Bible classes, other special classes, and we're looking for ways to improve presenting that message 
You know, just because we've done something for a long time doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. We can make changes within the limits of God's Word. If it will help reach people, if people will get more out of the teaching. And so we're open to those ideas and suggestions that you might have. We're looking within whatever wisdom we have to try to think of ways to improve that. But believe me when I tell you, that's our goal. And if you want to help with that matter, be glad to hear what you have to say. But that's what we're trying to do here. So that people who want to grow in Christ, they're not, the table, the, the refrigerator is not empty. There's plenty to eat. There's plenty to do spiritually that we might feast on the Word of God. Uh, and, and that's the church's job. And not just the elders. Look in, in our passage here in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul writes to this young church under fire. He's been separated from them for a time. And he writes, since we belong to the day. We're people of the day. We're not people of the night. That's the world. Let us be sober. We must put on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God has not destined us to receive wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, who died for us in order that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live together with him. When we die, we go to be with him, and while we're here, we live with him. So he says in verse 11, notice, encourage one another and build each other up as you're doing. Continue, he says, to bear one another's burdens. It's not just the elder's job to be an encouragement, is it? This congregation was encouraging to each other, for we had elders. Each of us looking out for ourselves and for our brother and our sister, young and old. We want to make it. We are family. And that kind of sense of urgency is exactly what Paul's writing to the Thessalonians about. You look in, in Colossians, and we could multiply these verses. But in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, you are the elect of God, holy and beloved. Act like it. Put on tender mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering bearing with one another, forgiving one another. You see how all these things might fit within that realm of bearing one another's burdens, being patient with each other? <laughs> if anyone has a complaint against another, as Christ forgave you, so must you do. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Every song we sing, we sing in honor to God, and we sing likewise to encourage one another. We ought to hear those songs. We ought to let them help us. I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago, I was attending a meeting. I think it was a morning meeting, as I recall. I don't, I, maybe not. But uh, we went to this place, and the fellow who was leading the singing, I'm sure he meant well, but he said, now I'll tell you, what we're going to do now. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. So we all stood up. And he said, I want you to turn around and look at your neighbor in the face as we sing this song. And that may have helped somebody. That didn't help me very much. I have to be honest with you. That just sort of distracted me. I didn't care a thing for that. You know, in fact, what I do a lot of times, close my eyes when I'm singing. That's just me personally. I'm not going to sleep. But it helps me focus on the voices. I hear the voice. I hear you singing. And that encourages me. It encouraged me to know that we, I sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And Rodney sings that same song. And Jeff sings that same song. Oh, how I love Jesus. And we're together in that. And we sing these lessons, and it's a blessing to us. And it should be. That's one of the benefits of coming together. The familiar passage in Hebrews 10. Consider how to motivate one another to love and good deeds. Isn't that bearing one of those burdens? Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some sad, but encouraging one another even the more as you see the day of the Lord coming nearer. Amen. So that's one side of it. It's the job. It's our job as individuals, at the home, the church. We're looking to help people with their spiritual burdens. But the other part of that passage was, every man shall bear his own burden. And that's right. 
That's the old, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink principle. I think there's a relationship between those two. One application of this is that Paul says, I don't care what people do for me. If I don't take it, it won't help me. And it's my fault. You may have parents who tell their children and tell their children, but if they don't take it, the good won't be done. You may have folks in the church the same way. Isn't that one of the great lessons Ezekiel is sometimes called the prophet of individualism? The Lord through Ezekiel taught that, reminded Israel of that principle, the soul that sins, it shall die. And he gives the example of the man who is just and lawful and right. He's not been an oppressor. He's not been a violent man. He's been merciful. He's just and right and he'll live. But if he begets a son and that son is a robber and a scoundrel, let me tell you, the goodness of his daddy ain't going to save him. Because every man shall bear his own burden. And if that man has a son and he turns out to be a godly man, he's going to be saved. And he won't have to live with the guilt of his father's sin because the soul that sins, it shall die. Every man shall bear his own burden. And I, that has something to say to us here. To the young people here, you have good parents who are trying to tell you what's right. You take it or leave it, but you're going to have to live with that consequence. Of course, it's going to affect other people too. But you're going to have to live with that consequence. Hearing the lesson is not enough. You've got to take it. I've got to take it. That's what the Lord said to Ezekiel. He says, you know, these people come and they hear you preach and they think, oh, this is great. Oh, come and listen to the word of the Lord. This is, this is amazing. And they have talk about how great it is. They don't mean it. With their mouth they do show much love, but their heart goes after the pursuit of their own gain of covetousness. You're a very lovely song. As one that has a pleasant voice and can play the instrument, but it has no penetration into the heart. And so I can sit in an assembly where the Bible might be taught and powerful lessons are taught by somebody. And I'm sitting there and I'm restless and I'm, my mind's a million miles away and I'm up and I'm down and I'm, I'm, I'm not getting any good out of this. That's my choice. I don't have to take the lesson. I don't have to take the help. But I tell you what I do have to do. I do have to answer for myself. That really gets my mind focused, doesn't it? It really helps me realize these things are serious. And God will hold us accountable. So let me just, in closing, remind you of a couple of illustrations, a couple of, of, of sorry, uh, applications of this principle. We can have the good teaching. We can, we can know and be told over and over again what we ought to do. But it's up to every individual whether they're going to obey the gospel or not. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, Repent and be baptized every one of you. We're not going to have somebody be baptized for all the brown-haired folks and somebody be baptized for all the tall folks. It's just not how it works. Every person has to decide for themselves. And as we grow, we're each responsible for where we are there. God knows our abilities and our opportunities. And in the case of the Hebrews 5, here were people who had had the time and opportunity, and when they ought to be teachers, they were far from it. Where are you on that regard? I'll tell you what, every man shall bear his own burden. And when it comes to purity... I think that the personal nature of that command there in 1 Timothy chapter 5 is striking. He told Timothy, a great young man, keep thyself pure. That's the only person that can keep you pure. You know, I think parents will do their best and they will set rules and they will try to teach their kids how to dress and where to go and where not to go and the kind of young person to be with. And I'll tell you, when it comes down to it, every young person is going to have to keep their own purity you can just nearly always find some way around a rule. If you're serious, if you just determine to do wrong, you can find a way. But remember this, every person must bear their own burden. When it comes to storing up treasure in heaven, 
It's a great thought, isn't it? I think the, the principle there is you use what God gives you now that God will be pleased with you and receive you later. That's the idea. And he says that's personal. You have to lay up for yourself, treasure. It's all made possible by the grace of God. We understand that. The Lord understood grace, I think. But he said you must do that for yourself. Another cannot. Judgment is that way. The story of the talents is a, a great reminder of the fact that here's a man, he gave to his servants an amount of money. Different amounts of money, but the same principle. He gives to another. He gave to three people who were there, the same Lord, the same type of treasure, the same class of individuals, but two of them put that to use and one of them out of fear, out of neglect, did anything but buried his treasure and wound up hearing uh, the condemnation of his Lord. It wasn't enough that he was in good company. He was judged individually. I'm not going to be judged by my good wife. You're not going to be judged by your good parents or your good kids. You're going to be judged based upon yourself, what you do. And I can accept that or ignore it, but every man shall bear his own burden. Let me close with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Let these familiar words speak to us this morning. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I hope that this morning we've been reminded of these two great old principles, that it's my job as a parent, as a Christian, as an elder, as a brother, as a friend, to bear one another's burdens and to do so with the right spirit and do so out of love. But it's also essential for me to realize ain't nobody going to pick me up and carry me over the threshold that I'm going to have to make it by choosing to submit to my God and nobody can force me to do that. It has to be my choice. Bear one another's burdens. Every man should bear his own burdens. I appreciate your kind attention. If you haven't already, please get out your songbooks, turn to the number that's been selected. And to be your desire this morning to obey the gospel of Christ. We'd be so glad to... Uh, to help you do that, and we'd be happy to assist you this morning in being baptized into the sonship of God. If you're here as one who as a child of God has not been faithful to the Lord that loves you, why not now? Make that right with him. If we can help you in any way, let us know how as Brother Chris leads us. Will you come while we stand, while we sing?